So with the permission of Revered Secretary Maharajan and express his wishes, may we request that we begin the panel discussion. The panelists are Brahmachari Oyan, Assistant Professor, Department of Philosophy at the Bibekarand University, Beirut Mott. We have Professor Uma Chattopadhyay, former head, Department of Philosophy, Calcutta University. <coughs> Sorry. Dr. Kuntala Bhattacharya, Professor of Philosophy, Rabindra Bharati University. Professor Nirmalu Narayan Chakraborty, Professor of Philosophy, Rabindra Bharati University. The moderator for the panel discussion is Professor Shobuj Koli Shen, Director of Studies, Education, Innovation and Rural Construction, Bishwa Bharati, Bolpur. Good afternoon. I welcome you all to this seventh of this seminar. Uh, first, I would like to express my sincere gratitude and thanks to Srimad Swami Supurnanandaji Maharaj, Swami Pragatmanandaji Maharaj, Professor Prabal Kumar Shin for inviting me in this international seminar to commemorate the 150th birth anniversary of Sister Nivedita. In this session, we have four speakers. Uh, I first request Brahmachari Oyan to present her, his uh, lecture, his paper, his article. His topic is Her Theological Determinism and the Illusion of Free Will, Sri Ramakrishna meets Lord Kems and Saul Smilnaski. Brahmachari Oyan. Om Sthapakaya Chadharmasya Sarva Dharma Swarupine Avatara Varishthaya Rama Krishnaya Te Namaha All of you know, I assume, that Sri Ramakrishna was a 19th century Bengali mystic. Um, in my recent work, I've been making the case that Sri Ramakrishna was also a sophisticated philosopher. And I've just finished writing a book called Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality, Sri Ramakrishna and Cross-Cultural Philosophy of Religion. That'll come out with Oxford uh, toward the end of this year. In that book, I focus on four topics, four central issues in cross-cultural philosophy of religion. The nature of God, religious pluralism, the nature and epistemology of mystical experience, and the problem of evil. And in one of my two chapters on the problem of evil, I have a section on Sri Ramakrishna's views on free will and determinism. And I subsequently expanded that one section into an entire article. And what I'll be presenting today is a very abbreviated version of that article on his views on free will and determinism. So I'll be basing my um, discussion on the teachings contained in the Sri Sri Ramakrishna Kothamrita, uh, written by Mohandranath Gupta, one of Sri Ramakrishna's householder disciples. So if we were to... Um, find a passage in Kothamrita that captures, in a nutshell, Sri Ramakrishna's views on free will and determinism, I think it would be this one. I'll read it slowly because I'll be unpacking it um, through the course of the presentation. Sri Ramakrishna says, It is God alone who does everything. You may say that in that case man may commit sin, but that is not true. If a man is firmly convinced that God alone is a doer and that he himself is nothing, then he will never make a false step. It is God alone who has planted in man's mind what the Englishmen call free will, shadi nicha. People who have not realized God would become engaged in more and more sinful actions if God had not planted in them the notion of free will. Sin would have increased if God had not made the sinner feel that he alone was responsible for his sin. And it continues, Those who have realized God are aware that free will is a false appearance. In reality, I am the machine and God is the operator. Bustato tini jontri ami jontro. I am the carriage and God is the driver. So I think one way to help clarify Sri Ramakrishna's position on free will and determinism is to bring in some concepts and terms from contemporary analytic philosophy. The two major approaches in contemporary philosophy are called compatibilist and incompatibilist approaches. So um, the, the compatibilist view is the majority view. Um, philosophers like P.F. Strassen, Michael McKenna, R.J. Wallace are all compatibilists. And what compatibilism means is that free will is compatible with determinism. So even if determinism is true, free still can still exist. And incompatibilist philosophers, 
these are in the minority, but some famous incompatibilists include Dirk Paraboom, Robert Kane, Galen Strawson. They argue that free will is incompatible with determinism. So that means that if determinism is true, then free will must be false. Then we must have no free will. And if free will is true, then determinism must be false. But both can't be true at the same time. So in light of this distinction in contemporary philosophy, I'm claiming that Sri Ramakrishna is best understood as a hard theological determinist. So soft and hard determinism corresponds to, so soft will correspond to compatibilist and hard will correspond to incompatibilist. So by hard determinism, I mean an incompatibilist determinism. And theological determinism, because God is the doer. God is what is who determines everything we do and think. So on my interpretation, Sri Ramakrishna was a hard theological determinist. That means that God determines everything we do, and therefore we have no free will in reality. And we have, in reality, no moral responsibility. That sounds scary, but I'm going to add that there's an important nuance in Sri Ramakrishna's view, which um, uh, substantially uh, kind of complicates his view. Okay? And that's the illusionism component, just to anticipate. Okay, so Sri Ramakrishna, in many places in the Kothamrita, he provides two different kinds of justification of his hard theological determinism. So first and foremost, because he was a mystic, it is a mystical justification. So this is just one example, but he says this repeatedly in the Kothamrita. He says, there is someone within me who does all these things through me. I am the machine and God is the operator. I act as she makes me act. I speak as she makes me speak. So Sri Ramakrishna's fundamental position is the, the best and most decisive and convincing way to justify hard theological determinism is to directly experience God as the doer. And he claimed to have had that experience. Okay? But in another place in Gautamrita, it's very interesting, uh, this issue of free will and determinism comes up again and again in the Gautamrita. And in one place, Dr. Mohandral Shorkar, who was Western educated, he was arguing with Girish Ghosh, the famous playwright, in front of Sri Ramakrishna about free will. And Dr. Sharkar, as a Western educated person, he was claiming, look, I'm not claiming we have 100% free will, but I'm claiming we have a kind of limited free will. And Girish Kosh, as a bhakta, and who followed Sri Ramakrishna's teachings fully, he was arguing with Dr. Sharkar and said, no, we don't even have limited free will. That, that's wrong. And then, at that point in the debate, Sri Ramakrishna chimes in, and he says this, to, to, and he, he provides what I'm calling a rational justification of, of his deterministic position. He says, in order to do anything, one must have a belief about something and feel joy at the thought of what he believes. Only then does he set about performing the work. Suppose a jar of gold coins is hidden underground. First of all, a man must have the knowledge or belief that the jar of gold coins is there. He also feels joy at the thought of the jar. Then he begins to dig. As he removes the earth, he hears a metallic sound. Dong, I think in Bangla it's Dong. That increases his joy. Next he sees a corner of the jar. That gives him more joy. Thus his joy is ever on the increase. This is a very subtle point that he's making. Um, what he is claiming is that we act on the basis of, we always act on the basis of a belief and our beliefs and our desires. And that ultimately we're not responsible for our beliefs and desires. So, so that's a kind of rational justification for determinism. Um, I, many of you have heard of Aurindam Chakraborty. He wrote an article um, in Sophia, the journal which is currently co-edited by Professor Bilimoria. Um, he wrote a really interesting article in 1988 called um, The Dark Mother Flying Kites, Sri Ramakrishna's Metaphysic of Morals, which discusses Sri Ramakrishna's views on free will and determinism. And he ha does a really good job of, of discussing this passage in arguing that um, Sri Ramakrishna is providing an argument on the basis of the law of psychophysical causation to justify his deterministic standpoint. So I'm in fundamental agreement with Chakraborty, and if you're interested, you can look at that article for further details. So at this point, one can raise a major objection. So the objection would run as follows. A person who feels that God does everything could just engage in sinful actions and justify them by saying that it is God who makes him sin. So this is a kind of perennial problem for determinists. So it, if determinism is true, and then I can just say, all right, so because determinism is true, I'm not responsible for what I do. So that's kind of, I take that as license to do whatever I want, including immoral things, right? That's the objection. So how does Sri Ramakrishna respond to this objection? I, 
would claim that he responds by distinguishing two different standpoints. The standpoint of the God-realized saint and the standpoint of the ignorant person. And he first discusses the standpoint of the God-realized saint. I'm, I'm just repeating the first paragraph, but I think it's important. It's from the passage that I mentioned in the beginning. It is God alone who does everything. You may say that in that case man may commit sin. So he's anticipating this objection here. But that is not true. If a man is firmly convinced that God alone is a doer and that he himself is nothing, then he will never make a false step. So what he's saying here is that if you have realized God, there's no possibility that you'll actually engage in immoral behavior because your will has merged entirely with God's will. And because God is perfectly good, you're not going to be capable of doing anything immoral. That's from the God-realized soul's standpoint. From the standpoint of the ignorant person, this is what he says. Or, or his position is that one who has not yet realized God has the illusion of free will. So this is the second crucial component or dimension of Sri Ramakrishna's views on free will and determinism is that he maintains that ordinary people who haven't realized God are under the illusion that they have free will and moral responsibility. And so this is what he says, it is God alone who has planted in man's mind what the Englishmen call free will. So it's interesting, he's, he's saying that this idea of free will is actually a kind of Western import, that the, the Western educated Calcutta people uh, believe, but that uh, he certainly doesn't. People who have not realized God would become engaged in more and more sinful actions if God had not planted in them the notion of free will. Sin would have increased if God had not made the sinner feel that he alone was responsible for his sin. So, um, he's saying that if anybody who has not realized God still does feel free will, and he necessarily feels free will, because God has planted that free will in him. And because of that illusion, he will... Of it doesn't mean that everybody's morally perfect, right? And that's, that's just not the case, what we see. But what Sri Ramakrishna is saying is that if, they, if we weren't endowed with that illusion of free will, we'd be committing far more sin. That's, that's the contention. And so that God, in His infinite wisdom, has implanted this illusion of free will in us, in ordinary non-God-realized people, people who are just ordinary jivas, in order to prevent sin from increasing. That's Sri Ramakrishna's position. Now we can confront another objection. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, what if an enlightened saint were to tell an ignorant person that free will is actually an illusion and that God alone determines everything we do? Could this lead the Agyani to abandon his belief in free will? And if it did, wouldn't the Agyani's premature belief in theological determinism have morally and socially disastrous consequences? So, to give a concrete example, so Sri Ramakrishna again and again in Kothamrita we find many devotees coming to him, the vast majority of them have not realized God. They're coming because they want to realize God, because they're attracted to his spiritual personality. And he's constantly teaching them, God is a doer, you are not the doer, ami karta, uh, ami, uh, tini karta, ami okarta, ami, ami jantra, tini jantri. So wouldn't that confuse the people who are still ignorant? If, if they're under the illusion that they're free, and then a God-realized saint comes and tells them, no, you're not free. Might that not send them into confusion? That's the objection. So how does Sri Ramakrishna respond to that kind of objection? What if the two standpoints, the standpoint of the God-realized saint and the standpoint of the ignorant person, what if they collide? Right? So one of his devotees brings this issue up. Okay? This, this was a follower of the Brahmo Shamaj. So the Brahmo says, If it is God that makes me do everything, then I am not responsible for my sins. Sri Ramakrishna, with a smile. Yes, Duryodhana also said that, O oh Krishna, I do what thou, seated in my heart, makest me do. If a man has the firm conviction, tik bishash, that God alone is the doer and he is his instrument, then he cannot do anything sinful. He who has learned to dance correctly never makes a false step. One cannot even believe in the existence of God until one's heart becomes pure. So this is a really interesting position which has, I think, quite interesting resonances with contemporary philosophy. Um, one way of... Uh, okay, so the basic position seems to be this. Sri Ramakrishna is saying, it's all well and good to, to say that God is a doer, but saying God is a doer and believing that God is a doer are not the same thing. And that actual belief in theological determinism requires that you realize God. And nothing short of that counts as... will, will actually ground... A, a robust belief in God as doer, okay? And this, if, if any of you are familiar with um, uh, contemporary epistemology and debates about doxastic voluntarism, um, this is quite relevant here. So, um, William Alston is a major contemporary philosopher who passed away a few years ago. He, uh, 
he published an article in 1988 called The Deontological Conception of Epistemic Justification. And here he's arguing against um, a popular position called doxastic voluntarism. Doxastic voluntarism is the view that we can adopt beliefs at will, voluntarily. That's why it's called doxastic voluntarism. Doxastic means over pertaining to beliefs. And William Alston is arguing against um, this position and I'm not going to go into the arguments because I don't have the time, but I want to one thing that makes his article interesting in particular is that he specifically mentions the example of belief in God and belief in God's existence. So what he says is, it is not within our power to choose to believe that God exists in the face of the lack of any significant inclination to suppose it to be true. Okay, but then somebody might say, wait a minute, but there are religious believers all over the world who say that they believe in God. So how do you explain those people, what those people say? And this is how he explains it in the second quotation. He says, S, person S, may be seeking for whatever reason to bring himself into a position of believing P. And S or others may confuse this activity, which can be undertaken voluntarily, with believing or judging the proposition to be true. So what Alston is saying is that people who claim that they believe in God without having directly had the mystical experience of God aren't actually, don't actually believe in God. They're trying to bring themselves into the position of believing in God. And I think that's exactly what Sri Ramakrishna's position is. So I think Sri Ramakrishna, like William Alston, rejects doxastic voluntarism, and that's the way that he responds to this colliding standpoint objection. Um, he's saying that, well, so long as you haven't realized God, you are stuck with this illusion of free will. So even if you you can say verbally that God is a doer, but you won't be able to internalize that. You won't be in that that one that doesn't constitute a belief until you actually realize God. Okay. Um, I, so okay. So I'll just, that I've already mentioned this, but I'll just summarize. So from Sri Ramakrishna's perspective, so long as I've not realized God, even if I profess to believe that God alone is a doer. I cannot help but feel that I am the doer. And we shouldn't confuse an unenlightened person's attempt to bring herself into a position to believe that God is a doer with the belief that God is a doer. Okay. So I'll just try briefly to mention some similarities and differences between um, two Western philosophers and Sri Ramakrishna's views. First is Lord Kames, Henry Holmes, who is rarely discussed. Um, he was a Scottish Enlightenment philosopher who was a philosophical mentor to David Hume. So Hume is much more famous, but his mentor is less widely known. And Keynes wrote an interesting essay in 1751 called Liberty and Necessity. And there, he defends a position remarkably similar to Sri Ramakrishna's. He, was a, he defended hard theological determinism, but at the same time he claimed that, even though that's the truth, God has endowed us with the illusion of free will. And so this is just a short quotation. Though man in truth is a necessary agent, having all his actions determined by fixed and immutable laws, Yet this being concealed from him by God, he acts with the conviction of being a free agent. So this is remarkably similar to Sri Ramakrishna's position. So that's the first similarity. The second is that, like Sri Ramakrishna, Kames justifies his hard theological determinism by arguing that our actions are caused by our desires which are not under our control. So there's a long passage which I would have quoted if I had more time, but um, I can point you to it after, after the lecture if you're interested. Kim says almost exactly the same thing that Sri Ramakrishna says about the gold coins, the jar of gold coins hidden underground. So Kim says that because our, our, whatever we do is determined by our desires and we're not ultimately responsible for our desires, that's a, a, a justification for believing in determinism, kind of philosophical justification for believing in determinism. Of course, that doesn't justify theological determinism. So, um, yeah, but it's enough to justify determinism according to Kim's. The third similarity, so Keynes, like Sri Ramakrishna, claims that God in his infinite wisdom has endowed us with, quote, a deceitful feeling of liberty in order to promote moral behavior and our overall welfare. So uh, Keynes, at several points in the essay, sketches these elaborate counterfactual scenarios where he imagines a world in which we didn't have this dece deceitful feeling of liberty and the disastrous moral consequences that would ensue and that the whole system, of, the system of uh, legal system of punishment would collapse, we would no longer have moral approval and disapproval, we couldn't say that that person did something bad or that person did something good, we wouldn't feel guilty when we did something bad, we wouldn't feel you know, uh, happy when we did something good or when other people did something good. And again, that should remind us of what Sri Ramakrishna said, he says sin would have increased if God had not endow endowed us with the illusion of free will. So they're, they're, they make similar counterfactual arguments to justify their, uh, 
to, uh, to illustrate why God endowed us with the illusion of free will. And fourthly, oh, okay, so that covers three and four, I guess, sorry. Oh, and this is a quotation from um, Keynes' essay, uh, which provides a counter counterfactual argument. So he says, we could feel no inward self-approbation on doing well, no remorse on doing ill, because both the good and the ill were necessary and unavoidable. There would be no more place for applause or blame among mankind. None of that generous indignation we now feel at the bad, as persons who have abused and perverted their rational powers. No more notion of accountableness for the use of those powers. No sense of ill desert or just punishment annexed to crimes as they're due, nor of any reward merited by worthy and generous actions. All these ideas and feelings so useful to men in their moral conduct vanish at once with the feeling of liberty. So this is an interesting passage, and it's one that should remind us of what Sri Ramakrishna says um, in the Katharmita. I wanted just to point briefly to two differences between Keynes' position and Sri Ramakrishna's. So the first difference is that for Keynes, philosophical inquiry is the only way to gain knowledge of determinism. And remember from earlier in my presentation that Sri Ramakrishna provide two different kinds of justification. The first is a mystical justification, the second is a rational justification. They agree on the rational justification, but Keynes was not a mystic and he didn't accept, I think, mystical cognition as a valid source of cognition. So, um, Sri Ramakrishna would say that actually the ultimate justification is having the direct experience of God as the doer, and Keynes wouldn't agree with that. And arguably that's an advantage uh, in Sri Ramakrishna's position, because as I pointed out, Keynes's philosophical argument only establishes, at best, the truth of determinism, but not theological determinism. So to push the argument toward theological determinism, arguably you might need a kind of mystical justification along the lines of what Sri Ramakrishna provides. And again, this is a whole another um, area of debate in contemporary analytic philosophy, the philosophy of mysticism. I have two chapters on that in my book, so if you're interested, you can look at my forthcoming book. It's on the epistemology of mystical experience. Um, and, okay, and the second difference um, is that Keynes, unlike Sri Ramakrishna, was a doxastic voluntarist. As, this is on my interpretation. That's, that's how I read Keynes. According to Keynes, someone might genuinely believe in determinism through philosophical reasoning, through the kind of argument that I mentioned before, that w when you start reasoning and thinking, what's the cause of my actions, you, you realize that the cause is desires. But then if you try to trace the, the causal origin of your desires, you find out that I'm not actually the source. Okay. Came seems to say that that's the only way to, to gain knowledge of determinism. Sri Ramakrishna, by contrast, claimed that we can gain direct knowledge of God as a doer through mystical experience. So I've already mentioned that, but th that seems to me to be an important difference. Um, okay. And I'll just briefly mention a parallel between Smolansky and Sri Ramakrishna. So Saul Smolansky is a contemporary philosopher, and um, he wrote a book called Free Will and Illusion in 2000. And it's quite interesting because not many people, not many contemporary analytic philosophers are interested in illusionism, the, the idea that we might be deluded into thinking that we have free will. But Smolansky wrote an entire book on this issue, and I think there are interesting resonances between his position and Keynes's and Sharamkis's positions. So in, in, in this book, Smolansky defends an illusionist position that cuts across recent analytic debates between compatibilists and incompatibilists. On the one hand, he agrees with hard determinists that there's no free will or moral responsibility in the ultimate sense. And the way he argues for it is to say that the idea of libertarian free will is actually incoherent. Okay. At the same time, he tries to capture the compatibilist intuition through illusionism by saying that we, we ne even though determinism is a truth, we nonetheless act under the illusion that we're free and morally responsible for our actions. And what Smolansky is claiming is that that illusion of free will is enough to secure compatibilist moral responsibility. And I think that Sri Ramakrishna would have uh, embraced that position because I think that's exactly why Sri Ramakrishna says that God has endowed us with the illusion of free will. So that sin would not increase, so that we would still feel morally responsible for our actions. Um, and like both Keynes and Sri Ramakrishna, Smolansky provides elaborate counterfactual scenarios along the lines um, of what Keynes mentions. So Smolansky argues that our entire moral life would be jeopardized if we did not act under the illusion that we were free. Um, and he, he has several chapters on these issues, kind of um, going into great detail and explaining how our moral judgments, our uh, act of moral approval and disapproval, uh, all these things would collapse without, without this illusion of free will. And, but unlike Sri Ramakrishna Smolansky, he says at several points in this book that um, we, should, we should try to hide the dangerous truth of determinism from other people. And this is really interesting. And um, he seems to think that he, 
he seems to think that this is such a kind of dangerous truth that he seems to be aware of and that maybe a small minority of philosophers might also be aware of, but that we, it's our duty to hide it from everybody else. Otherwise, it could have really disastrous moral consequences. At the same time, he entertains the possibility that there could be what he calls unillusioned moral individuals. This is really interesting. UMIs, he calls them. That is, exceptional individuals who continue to act morally even though they have freed themselves from the illusion of free will and moral responsibilities, uh, moral responsibilities. So he never says it outright, but it seems like he thinks of himself as a UMI or at least a kind of partial UMI. Um, so he's too humble to admit it, maybe. And so he tells others who are also philosophically convinced by his argument that you know, even if you if you or if you're convinced that determinism is true, please don't tell others because it'll be really bad. Um, now, Sri Ramakrishna, I think, would have found Smolansky's argument kind of alarmist and overblown. Okay? And that's because I think the key difference is that Sri Ramakrishna rejected Doxastic voluntarism, whereas uh, Smolansky accepts, seems to accept it. So, so, because, so Sri Ramakrishna would say, even if a UMI, using Smolansky's term, unenlightened moral individual, even if you were to tell an unenlightened person the truth of determinism, the unenlightened person would still necessarily behave as if he were free. Because he can't just, okay, even if a UMI like a Smolansky would come and tell me, an ignorant person, somebody who's deluded in thinking I'm, uh, that I'm free, uh, you know, you're not free. I can't just say, oh, in that case, let me enjoy myself and just do whatever I want. I, I, that, that illusion of free will is stuck with me. That's Sri Ramakrishna's position. So because Sri Ramakrishna rejects doxastic voluntarism, he avoids one of the more controversial and problematic aspects of Smolansky's argument, which is this kind of almost Nietzschean um, dimension, which is that you know, there is this kind of elite group of supermen who know the truth and that their job is to hide that truth from everybody else, the masses. Um, OK, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I thank Brahmacharya Ayan Maharaj for his excellent presentation. Like uh, previous sessions, we will have question and answer after all the papers all are presented. So I uh, request Professor Uma Chatterjee to present her uh, paper on the concept of upamana as comprehended in cross-system and cross-cultural analogy. Namaskar to everyone. <clears throat> My deep respect to Secretary Maharaj, Sri Shuparna Nandaji, and our <coughs> another beloved Maharaj, Prabhupada Nandaji. We were discussing regarding all these ideas on one day. I am also obliged to all the senior members who have organized the seminar and happy for organizing this type of seminar. And in addition to that, I am much more obliged that I have got an invitation to say something. Not on Sister Nibedita, whom I loved, no doubt, but on the multidisciplinary, this approach of philosophy, which was hinted by Professor Jail Shaw on that inaugural session that how we can think about Indian philosophy in relation to the Western philosophy today. So as Professor Shen, my regard also to her and my respect to my co-participants, already she has mentioned the title of my paper. So now I I'm going to present. Also, there are my teachers. I'm afraid of them. Uh, Krishna, these there. <laughs> anyway, I have to get courage and I'm to present. Indrani, these there. Tara, these there. Objective of my paper is to show how and why the multicultural philosophies and at the same time the cross-cultural philosophies admit some concepts as very basic and necessary. 
We know that Indian philosophy and culture is different from Western philosophy and culture. And within India also, the philosophical systems are different from each other in many ways. I do not want to make any comparative study between the cross-cultural philosophies and intercultural systems of philosophies in India. My focus will be only on two concepts like similarity and knowledge by analogy, upaman, to show how they are used in different philosophical systems of India and Western philosophy. And after that, I need to show, I want to show actually that in which way we do philosophy nowadays to understand more closely Indian philosophy in relation to the Anglo-American philosophy and others. In the Western tradition, the effort to reduce universal to similarity is quite common. common. Many empiricist philosophers <coughs> tried to define universal in terms of similarity or resemblance, including family resemblance. But attempt to understand similarity in terms of universal is something uncommon. In the Indian, in Indian tradition, on the other hand, attempt to define universal in terms of similarity is not at all common. The Bodho philosophers do not accept universal they are also against the admission of similarity. Their theory of apoho, by which they replace universal, is not a theory of similarity. Some Advaita Vedantins reject jati in a very technical sense, but they also have not reduced jati to similarity. But attempts have been made in the Bhattomi Mangsha tradition to define similarity in terms of jati, it has also been recognized that two universals can be similar, as they are both permanent. At the same time, two individuals can be considered similar on the ground that they share the same universal property. Scholars of philosophy take this notion of similarity as a typical philosophical concept, where philosophers alone can take alone take interest and which have little value outside philosophy, this concept of similarity. That is not so, was hinted at by Bhatshayan in the context of the discussion of Upaman Pramano. It is very important notion, the notion of similarity, not only in philosophy, but also outside philosophy. But we did not know how to show in concrete terms and in detail the usefulness of similarity and the sense of similarity in the larger context. W. V. Quine, o. Quine, Quine's paper, Natural Kinds, admirably shows us, us the way. He tells us that the story of the global development of science can be retold in terms of similarity. The development of science, he shows, is another story which is continuous with it. Quine stresses again and again that though from the point of view of logic and set theory, the notion of similarity and natural kinds are suspected, they are fundamental and central to our thinking and learning. He shows how one's learning of language, of words, involve similarity. Quine says, there is nothing more basic than past utterances after some line, utterances of it. Three major points we find in Quine's paper. One, the definition or explanation of similarity. Secondly, relation between similarity and kind of kind, kind or universal, and three, the role which similarity plays in our learning of word and thinking. The important point here we note is this, Quine as well Indian philosophers made their views on them. Similarity as a matter of fact plays many roles in our life. The interesting point in Indian tradition here is the Mimangsha school, which admits both the reality or the independent existence of similarity and also of universal. They admit both similarity and universal, the Mimangsha school. The Nayo, on the other hand, 
admits the usage of similarity, but does not admit the independent existence of similarity. The important point to note here is that the similarity shadrisho is used in the context of upaman, knowledge by analogy, both by the Nayo and the Mimangsha schools. It is known to us that Mimangsha school admits upamano not for language learning. The Nayo school, on the other hand, admits upaman in the context of language, word meaning learning. The Nayo school admits upaman as shukti grahok and as a distinct praman. It is the very important characteristics of Nayo school that they admit one praman upaman, which is at the same time a shukti grahok praman. And other pramanas, so, so they classify the pramanas, the four pramanas to shukti grahoko and the bostu grahoko. Perception, inference, and shabda pramano are bostu grahoko. And only upaman is a shukti grahoko praman. So, but it is a praman, it has distinct existence, distinct, uh, distinctness, it is irreducible source of knowledge. This is the speciality of this particular tradition in Indian philosophical schools. So they admit is Upaman as the Shokti Grahok and as a distinct Praman. None of the schools in Indian tradition admit Upaman as Shokti Grahok. Either they deny this source or they reduce this to other Pramanos as we know that Charbak, etc. they are not admitting, Buddhists are not admitting and they are either discarding or reducing this Praman to other sources of knowledge that schools have shown the weakness of Praman, either they have shown the weakness of the Praman and so discard it. But we see that the Nayo's tradition from Gautam to Gangesh, the stalwart philosophers, has admitted Upamano and they have admitted this pr uh, Pramano as Shokti Grahoko. This is the beauty of Indian philosophy and culture. Many things we find which are implicit in the, the Shutra texts, but they were there. It is only we have not nurtured properly. We have not seen the text, the interpretations we don't find. So this is a particular uh, sp uh, this uh, place where I see that Upaman is admitted by the stalwart philosopher Gautam. And after that, so many discourse, so many discussions, so many criticisms. After so many criticisms from different corners, the, in the 12th century, Gange Shupadha Agi again is taking into consideration that Upaman Pramano and as the Shukti Grahak Praman to know the word meaning relationship, relationship. And so we understand what kind of importance they give in discarding or in accepting the ideas. So the old idea is taken in the new packet by Gangesh and he has given the status to the Supaman Praman. And the Upaman Praman is important to know the word meaning relation and this Praman depends on the knowledge of similarity. So similar knowledge of similarity is also so much important in philosophy which has also importance in science and other different subjects always. So we cannot make the uh, difference between the different schools of sciences because they are also similar to each other. Similarity plays such a deep role in different sciences and different social sciences. Anyway, well, the Nayo school admits Upaman analogy or the knowledge of similarity for the knowledge of word meaning relation, Padupadartha Shamandhu. So also Quine admits knowledge of similarity for the knowledge of word meaning relation. We do not want to say that there is a similarity between Nayo tradition and Quine, but the point is to state, and this was mentioned by Professor Shaw, I was happy on that day. That is not only to show that he is mentioning and he is mentioning. What will give? What is the benefit for that? Yes, may, they may admit, both of them may admit, but what is the uh, role or what is the importance by that? So this is very important. We are here also, my objective is not only to show that both of them are admitting similarity, both of them are using similarity for the word meaning relation, for, for the knowledge of word meaning relation. So important that traditional philosophical schools as well as the modern scientist philosophers are thinking in the same way. So this is a meaningless to say that Indian philosophy is uh, not at all. So it is, I agree to that point, is not only to say that Indian philosophy uh, is only uh, the system of spirituality. No. Spirituality is there the way we understand. But it is not the whole thing of the philosophy. Finally, it may lead to that. 
but by the monono, that is rationalization, rigorous logic, rigorous understanding, then we go to the spirituality or non-spirituality, whatever that may be. But that is not the objective of philosophy. That is not only the subject matter of philosophy. So it is, to, it is a kind of deep misunderstanding of Indian philosophical tradition. So it is not, this is only a system of spirituality. This is not to be accepted. We don't accept because we have a vast literature where we find that the philosophy are taking so much interest, so much deep logic to make a position clear and to make a position very scientific, very logical to different uh, cultures and different this, uh, subjects, to the different social sciences as well. So this is a view, this is a <coughs> point which has been so vividly highlighted by Professor Jail Shah Namaskar for that. So in his keynote address, uh, to this, uh, this, this uh, conference, Indian philosophy has time and again raises many intricate questions which even modern Western philosophers have identified, identified as some of their crucial issues of deliberation. And we have not given much more importance to that, so do, we don't, don't find the answer to that questions. So it is the time already, we, many scholars, they have started, many stalwart scholars, they have started. We have to continue that. Rather, we need to understand in the new perspective the deep significance of Indian philosophy, and it is to see the contribution of Indian philosophy in the world of global philosophy. Here we have taken only two concepts, similarity and knowledge by analogy. As I have already mentioned that in the Bhashya commentary of Bhatshayan, he has int hinted the point that similarity is not only within the philosophy, it has use it outside philosophy. And in science, in social science, in history, without using the notion of similarity, we cannot proceed. So that is there, Vatsharan has hinted already, and we can now take into consideration, after that, the philosophers are debating on the very issue of similarity, on the issue of the knowledge of similarity, whether similarity has its own independent existence, whether it is reducible to universal or it, has, it is independent. So many, many questions they are raising from the different schools. And this is one thing. And the other thing, I have taken only two concepts, the analogical knowledge. Analogical knowledge for the scientific prediction, there is also kind of induction, and Quine has mentioned that. There is also, without, without the knowledge of similarity, we cannot make this. And not only that, for the knowledge of what meaning relation also, we need the knowledge of similarity. So similarity is the basis, and knowledge of similarity is the basis, according to both. So in this way, in different cases, by taking different notions, we can understand more deeply from the Indian philosophical culture and tradition. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chatterjee. And now I request Professor Kuntala Bhattacharya to present her paper on uh, Buddhist reductionism, a few queries. <coughs> Respected chairperson and very distinguished audience, uh, I feel really privileged that I have been invited to take part in this uh, seminar, international seminar, to commemorate the 150th birth anniversary of Sister Nivedita. Especially so because I am a pass out of Ramakrishna Sharada Mission Sister Nivedita Girls School. And so, um, before uh, my topic today is Buddhist, uh, Buddhist reductionism, a few queries. Um, before presenting my queries, I would just like to state very, very briefly what uh, reductionism uh, about persons amounts to. Now, reductionism is generally characterized as a theory which attempts to reduce entities of one sort to entities of another sort. A reductionist would hold about things of kind P that the existence of P just consists in the existence of certain other things, things that can be described without asserting or presupposing that P exists. 
This means that a reductionist about P has no ontological claim regarding P. The term ontology, however, may pose problems here. There are theorists who admit levels of reality and might say that though P is not acceptable as existent in the true sense of the term, it is existent in a loose practical sense. For these theorists, ontology should be understood as equivalent to ultimate ontology. And such theorists can be considered reductionists about P in the sense that P is not included within the ultimate ontological entities they admit. Reductionism in this sense may accept uses of the word P in ordinary language because such usages serve practical purposes. Now, classical Indian philosophical schools like the Nyaya Bhushishika, the Sankhya Yoga, and the Mimamsa are non-reductionist. Non-reductionists also about persons. For if P stands for self, for these schools, there is nothing else which the self consists in. The term self has a solid referent or a referent which has a distinct ontological status. Now the Abhidharma Buddhists, however, do not believe in a self that is a permanent substratum and a seat of attributes like cognition, pleasure, or pain. In order to show that a self of this kind does not exist, the early Buddhists or the Abhidharmika Buddhists, they adopt a method of deconstruction. Whatever one understands by the notion I, that means a person, is figured out, these concepts are identified as matter, rupa, feeling, vedana, perception, shanjya, volition, sanskara, and consciousness, or vijjana. These categories are termed skandhas, which means heap or collections, and should be understood in a technical sense. Thus, matter means anything corporeal or physical. Feeling stands for pleasure, pain, and indifference. Perception for those mental events whereby the sensible characteristics of a perceptible object are determined. Volition for the different mental states which cannot be included within perception, feeling, and consciousness. Consciousness for pure grasping in relation to its object. That is, the physical basis of personality formation is matter, that is rupa, and the mental elements are represented by the four other concepts in the collection, which is uh, uh, considered as namo, which is regarded as namo. Uh, each of these collections consists of several members, and these members are referred to as dharmas. This is why uh, these are called collections, because they comprise of dharmas, or they are a collection of dharmas. For the Vaibhashikas, these dharmas were 75 in number, while for the Sautrantikas, they were 43. Now, the Buddhist strategy of deconstructing the self not only consists in identifying the parts, but also in establishing that these constituents exhaust or sufficiently explain the traditional concept of self. Other than identifying the constituents of a person, the whole process requires, therefore, the view that there is a whole over and above the parts be negated. The process, again, requires arguing for a doctrine of impermanence, for if it can be shown that each of the constituents of the self are impermanent, then it can be proved that there can be nothing which can be called self in the sense that it is enduring. Now, Abhidharmika Buddhism, therefore, is not in, uh, not in favor of non-dualism. Rather, the doctrine of five skandhas expresses a kind of mind-body dualism. It claims that the being we call a person has physical as well as non-physical or mental constituents, and these mental, uh, and these mental uh, constituents can in no way be reduced to physical events, such as complex events that characterize body and brain functions. Yet the Abhidharmikas are practicing a kind of reductionism because their doctrine of non-self says that the persons do not exist in strict sense of the term. The existence of a person consists in the existence of other things, that is, in the existence of non-personal, physical, and mental elements. Now, uh, this is my humble objection, which I would like to find an answer to. 
um, that uh, what it seems is that the Buddhists are not reductionists in terms of persons, at least in this sense of the term. And the common objection actually against such reductionism, it is a common objection that they are unable to explain memory. Uh, memory is impossible unless there is a continuity. Wa one who sees remembers, one who hasn't seen does not. So the Buddhist says, in answer to this objection uh, from the memory side, that memory can be explained through an analysis of the unity relation into certain causal relations holding among the skandhas. The sans sanskaras or the experience memory connections is as follows. I now seem to remember the early experience or earlier experience because my having that experience at that earlier time caused a memory trace that was retained and is currently being activated. Now, such a reductionist might claim my being the same person over time just consists in there being many experience memory causal relations. Now, uh, I feel that this admitting uh, or admission of such memory exper experience memory causal relation presuppose the concept of a person because uh, or this merely mm, masks a covert appeal to persons as continuance. I mean a memory uh, this view says that for a memory TN to consider uh, to occur there should be a sensation of the form T. Now so we have to identify which causal connections are the right ones uh, in this experience memory stream. Now I would like to ask, we could know which causal connections are the right ones only if we already know what it means for a person to continue to exist over time. So uh, I'd like to uh, just present this objection and um, Thank you for being here. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya. Now I request Professor Nirmalo Naran Chakraborty to present his lecture, Cross-Cultural Multidisciplinary Philosophy. At the very outset, let me express my sincere thanks to the organizers for kindly inviting me to this seminar. Uh, <clears throat> I would uh, like to share my understanding of uh, what comparative philosophy is like. And also, I would like to share my um, a bit of uneasiness with some of the models of comparative philosophy that is available before us. And I'm glad that, uh, you know, uh, during the question answer session of the just uh, the last session, uh, some of these points have been raised. Uh, uh, so, so whatever I'm going to, uh, you know, say uh, is in tune with, with, with that uh, kind of, uh, those kinds of queries. Uh, <coughs> I shall be using uh, the phrase comparative philosophy instead of uh, cross-cultural, cross multicultural philosophy, because that's, just, uh, that's the phrase uh, uh, most commonly used. And I shall be talking about comparative philosophy, especially in the context of, of the kind of academic philosophy that is practi practiced in India. Uh, in a way, uh, uh, for the students of philosophy uh, as a discipline in Indian colleges and universities, comparative philosophy is inevitable because you know we are uh, being taught since the undergraduate days. Uh, we are uh, uh, being taught uh, about uh, the philosophers of these two, three, four different traditions. So in a way, it is inevitable. But um, the question for me is uh, why to do it and how to do it? These are the two questions that I would like to you know, address uh, today. And these are the questions that have been you know, coming up again and again in many uh, 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 discussions and forums like this. 
um, philosophical questions start their journey with the human urge to fathom the mysteries that man encounters in his surrounding environment. These questions constitute some of the fundamental mortal queries, questions like the origin of the universe, the nature of I, the destiny of man, etc. These questions are manifestations of the human urge to know exhibiting his love of wisdom as the etymology of the word philosophy implies. Gradually, with the flow of time, these questions were reformulated, framed, and answered in varied ways. Many more related questions were raised, and attempts were made to systematize them in a rigorous manner. Philosophy as an independent discipline marked by its own set of problems and methodology evolved. Philosophy does not start in a vacuum. Even asking a question requires a background knowledge. And this background knowledge for historical contingencies were manifest in different ways in different geographical spaces. The different intellectual horizons of the demanding mind provided man with wide-ranging ideas and insights, resulting in raising assorted queries, sometimes formulating the same question from a different perspective. And with the intensification of thought and analysis, philosophical systems expanded and developed in very many ways. Even within a specific geographical boundary, people might have lived through varied experiences, producing different intellectual motivations to formulate certain questions and respond to these questions from what one thinks to be his or her privileged position. This much of pluralism seems inevitable. In fact, the commentorial tradition of classical Indian philosophical systems betray this benign pluralism in the untiring effort of each of the systems confronting the other systems and constantly engaging in raising new problems and reformulating its earlier stances so as to be able to successfully respond to the possible objections, sometimes even an imaginary one. This is a beautiful example of creative comparative philosophy. With the arrival of colonialism in India, the term comparative philosophy gained a new momentum. Comparative philosophy in colonial India acquired a different connotation, different from the creative comparative philosophy that has been there in practice in classical period. One of the far-reaching consequences of colonial regime is manifest in its implementing English education. Due to various socio-political reasons, the India that East India Company met was in a mess. The social cohesiveness and the state power were in a dire state. Many people in India at that time saw the arrival of the East India Company as a blessing. Soon, the weighing scale of the businessman turned into the scepter of a ruler. And both the ruler and his subjects thought it to be prudent to introduce the English education. With fast speed, the millennium old indigenous learning system collapsed making room for intuitions, institutions imparting European education, bringing along with its philosophy, culture, religion, etc. The civilizing role of the English education system overwhelmed the vast majority of the people. This complete rupture in the age-old traditional knowledge system has got some interesting consequences for the Indian academic scenario especially with regard to philosophy. It is to be noted that the, for the first time in her history, Indian philosophers got in touch with a highly developed alternate philosophy. Enamored by the great figures of Diven European philosophy, 
Many Indian philosophers engaged themselves into study of European philosophers. Interestingly, interestingly these Indian philosophers of the colonial time, of the early colonial period, focused on those very European philosophers who they thought might echo some Indian philosophical ideas. The projects of European philosophy became the projects of Indian philosophers. The lion's share of the curriculum of the education institutions founded on the European model was devoted to European philosophy with hardly anything on the classical Indian philosophical commentaries, especially when these commentaries are the real repositories of Indian philosophical insights. Both the content and the method of teaching and learning philosophy in Indian institutions changed dramatically. With the rise of nationalist fervor, some philosophers started taking the classical Indian philosophical ideas seriously. Many institutions were founded to impart teaching of indigenous philosophical systems, independent of European philosophical ideas. Our Jatiya Shikha Parishad, the previous version of Jadupur University, is a brilliant example of that. But with the spread of English education institutions, exposure to European philosophy became inevitable. Some philosophers with a nationalist spirit embarked on a comparative philosophy with the agenda to prove that many of the ideas propounded in recent European philosophy have been well articulated much earlier in ancient Indian philosophy. This claim, they thought, would blunt the civilizing claim of European philosophy. Some others, within the largely nationalist framework, try to assimilate some of the European philosophical ideas in the Indian philosophical trajectory in a nuanced manner. Philosophy in the works of these thinkers is neither purely Indian nor purely Western. And I, I should, you know, use, uh, I should caution that Western, quote unquote, is not, is not a homogenic you know, brand of philosophy. So this is not a philo comparative philosophy with a hidden agenda. This is a creative comparative philosophy which is marked by the originality of the author. And Kesi Bhattacharya is the most eminent representative of this school. Especially I'm reminded of Kesi Bhattacharya's appropriation of Kant in the Indian philosophical uh, system. This is one, kind, one brand of comparative philosophy, which I call creative comparative philosophy. With India and the West coming into contact with each other, intellectual interaction stepped up. But with the civilizing idea being quite well spread, there are philosophers who, while well exposed to European thought, nonetheless articulated and explained the philosophical insights available in classical India. Indian philosophical ideas got reinterpreted and reframed in contemporary jargon. In the works of these authors, Indian philosophy is never looked at through the prism of Western philosophy. Radhakrishnan is perhaps the most important figure in this genre. It is interesting to note that with the exchange of philosophy between India and West, Indian philosophy never received the attention of the philosophers, of the academic philosophers in the West. It is true that a large number of Indologists in the West have made significant contribution to the studies of Indian languages, religion, history, etc. But the great treasure of Indian philosophy, hidden in the large number of commentaries, never received the attention that they deserve from the Western philosophers. And uh, from the pictures that Professor Vaidya uh, has shown this morning, I, I had some personal correspondence with, with many of them, Timothy Williamson, John McDowell, and uh, unfortunately, they, they have not you know, been, been uh, reciprocating the kind of ideas that people like uh, you know, uh, Professor Shaw or Professor Bill Moria are engaged in. 
But the great treasure of Indian philosophy hidden in the large number of commentaries never received the attention that they deserve from the Western philosophers, and I mean academic philosophers. Apart from the socio-political reasons, there is a widespread impression among the Western philosophers that Indian philosophy is mystical, spiritual, otherworldly, etc. And consequently, Indian philosophy is not philosophy proper. To remedy this wrong and biased idea about Indian philosophy, some philosophers have engaged themselves in the study of Indian philosophy by focusing on those specific questions and debates in classical Indian systems that have their cousins in some parts of Western philosophy. And some parts, I mean. These works are aimed at proving that if Indian philosophy contains the debates and queries that have their counterparts in Western philosophy, then Indian philosophy is at par with this Western philosophy insofar as its status as philosophy is concerned. And Professor B.K. Mathial is perhaps the most important uh, name in this attempt. So thus, one sees that in post-colonial India, comparative philosophy has been pursued in different ways and with different motives. One, comparative philosophy with a parochial bias, okay, which is, you know, which can be summarized in that famous, uh, rather satirical phrase of uh, Meghnath Shah, Shabi Bade Ase. Uh, second, comparative philosophy, creative comparative philosophy, a la Kesi Bhattacharya. Third, comparative philosophy with a clamor to claim that one brand of philosophy is no less a philosophy than the other, a la B.K. Matilal. Philosophical concepts and debates come with a baggage. And if philosophy is an attempt on the part of the humans to explain and decipher his experiences, then in order to understand these questions and conjectures, we have to place them in the conceptual landscape against which the deliberations took place. In other words, what we are dealing with is not a singular question or a concept. It is rather a fabric of ideas and speculations. We are talking about a philosophical conceptual scheme, to use the fashionable expression. So understanding one philosophical system is interpreting an alien conceptual system. Comparative philosophy then devotes itself into interpreting alternative conceptual systems. Let me try to unpack what is involved in interpreting a conceptual system. The interpreter tries to decipher a particular conceptual system. Notice the interpreter is already working within a conceptual system. So interpreting an alien conceptual system consists in translating the alien conceptual system in one's own conceptual vocabulary. Thus, there are two conceptual systems at work. And moreover, for translating one into another, we need a manual that would map the target conceptual system onto the home conceptual system. But then the translation manual itself is couched in a vocabulary that falls outside the realm of the two conceptual systems, or at least should be rich enough to encapsulate both the conceptual schemes. Unless we assume that the interpreter is already in possession of this translational conceptual scheme, any talk of interpreting the foreign conceptual scheme cannot take off the ground. Then, the same question could be asked about the understanding of the translational conceptual scheme, and we would be moving backward ad infinitum. We have to assume two things in order to make sense of our attempt to interpret the alien conceptual scheme. One, we have to assume that the interpreter has some knowledge, even if rudimentary in nature, of the world that the interpretee talks about. There is an overlapping shared world that is accessible to both the interpreter and the interpretee. This is, in other words, a move to a kind of realism. Two, the interpreter must also assume that a large number of statements found in the alternate conceptual system are believed to be true by the participants of the foreign conceptual system. 
Interpretation, including raw interpretation, can work only on the assumption that the interpretee is sincere in her beliefs and that the participant is non not lying, etc. This is, in other words, a move towards charity. In other words, a common public space and a mutual trust are necessary re prerequisites in any interpretative project. None of these, of course, implies that interpretation does not fail. Radical disagreement and massive error would render the interpretative work impossible to start with. If translation manual is indispensable for interpretation, then we must entertain the possibility of alternative translation manuals, and so we must make room for alternative interpretations of the alien conceptual scheme. Pluralism is the natural outcome of this multiple interpretations. It is hardly possible to come up with a criterion of choice of one particular interpretation merely on the basis of some objective matter of facts, because, simply because there is no such vantage point. This is precisely why interpreting conceptual schemes or alternative philosophical systems is such a challenging work. What this shows is that comparative philosophy does not have a monolithic linear structure. There is a lot of bootstrapping involved, sometimes moving ahead, sometimes moving backwards. One should be circumspect of the very idea of comparative philosophy. Comparative philosophy in the field of Indian academic philosophy is inescapable. Philosophy, qua philosophy, should be courageous enough to stand in front of novel interrogations and doubts, and it is the onus of a philosopher to answer, and if necessary, to reformulate and revise her own standpoint. If philosophy is not to be reduced to a mere history or record of ancient thoughts, if philosophy is to be living and thriving, if philosophy is to invigorate man's understanding of his surroundings, then creative comparative philosophy remains our desired goal. One philosophical system needs to confront the other, but and this is, I think, important, this confrontation must not be understood in terms of one system competing with the other. One philosophical system need not emulate another. Let us be sincere pluralists and not selective pluralists. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Chakraborty. Now these uh, presentations are open for discussion. We have 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes for discussion. And I have some query from Brahmachari Oyan that uh, if uh, Sri Ramakrishna is a hard theological determinist, and this uh, hard determinism always rejects free will and also ethics. So how can we explain the ethical concepts which we find in his teachings if he is a hard theological yeah. determinist? It's a good question. Hello? Hello, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, my claim is that he does that, he secures ethics via illusionism, right? It's, be it's because even though the, tr the metaphysical truth is hard theological determinism, he still says that so long as we haven't realized God, we, we're, we're, we're necessarily acting under the illusion of free will, and therefore we necessarily take responsibility, moral responsibility for our actions. So there's still scope for ethics. And then once you realize God, you don't need ethics. You've transcended ethics. You've gone beyond good and evil. But can we say that he was a compatibilist or libertarianism? Uh, libertarianism. There are different interpretations. I think Audinam Chakraborty in that article I mentioned in Sophia actually leans more toward a, a sort of compatibilist uh, reading of Sri Ramakrishna. So I would disagree with that. His reading is ambivalent I th or ambiguous, and I have difficulty understanding it. But I, my position is that Sri Ramakrishna was an uncompromising, hard theological determinist. One could interpret it in multiple ways, but that's the interpretation that I defend in my article. Okay. And I, I have diff I, I couldn't present all the evidence for it just because I didn't have the time. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Oh, okay. So I'll just follow up. Um, 
Here is an, uh, uh, an issue that came up in your paper that I think if you said something about would make it uh, more attractive. Mm. So the issue is you made the alignment between the rejection of doxastic voluntarism between Sri Ramakrishna and William Olmston. I think that's a good move. But there's another issue about agency that sits right below that. And that mm. issue is the following, is that some people think that when hard determinism is articulated, then you have an error theory of the self and an error theory of agency, and there are no mental states. Mm -hmm. Mental states have, some, uh, for some views, a connection to agency. So the mere alignment of the rejection of doxastic voluntarism, um, I don't think is enough as much as saying something also about the question of, what is a desire for a hard determinist? That's the question. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if you're a hard determinist, there is nothing that's really a desire. Desire has some interaction with agency and its productive processes. I mean, it just, it seems to me that like, um, insofar as you're pushing that line and you went as far as to reject the doxastic voluntarism part, which I think is a good move as you, you correctly argue how it will work within the system of Sri Ramakrishna. Mm. But I think if you can now also say what Sri Ramakrishna would want to have said about this issue of the self and agency, what is the, the, what is the nation of that? Then I think you would have more, you would have done more. That's great, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I wasn't aware of that. So I'll ask you later for the literature that I can look up, thanks. Um, just a little, um, quibble with uh, Professor Nirmali Chakrabarti. So you, you mentioned towards the end, uh, you know, uh, we shouldn't, uh, history of philosophy is not really, yeah, it's because about rec recording uh, uh, traditions and so on. But in fact, I think we need to go back and redo the history of Indian philosophy to some extent, which is why I was involved in the project of the Routledge History of Indian Philosophy, to which you have contributed very gladly. The reason being that in some of the accounts that have sort of been given off early uh, periods of philosophy, the colonial, early 20th century Indian philosophy, and your account uh, of, of, say, I'll just pick one example, of Radhakrishnan in particular, I think you were trying to make a claim that he wasn't so particularly influenced by, you know, Western philosophy and so forth. He was trying to do Indian philosophy. So I, I read him very differently. I, I have a paper on uh, Radhakrishnan uh, saving appearances in Plato's Academy, you know. I mean, he was had a very Neoplatonist kind of a reading of, 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 of Upanishads of the Indian philosophy, which you can, in, in retrospect, you see that coming through. There's an element of apology, uh, of, you know, the, the work that uh, Nalini Bhushan and Jay Garfield have done sort of also showed there's a, quite a contrast between what Brother Krishnan was doing and what someone like Mulkani was doing, for example, you know. Um, and so there are, there are, you know, even Das Gupta, you know, the Das Gupta's history of philosophy almost hardly anybody reads now because it's, it's, it's almost, uh, inaccessible. You just don't really know where is he coming from, what, what sort of language he's actually using. Um, and you know, there was of course a very strong streak of neo Hegelianism that was running through at that period as well. And that comes through again in Radhakrishnan and in, in even uh, you know, with all due respect um, in Casey Bhattacharya as well. So I don't think they really escaped that because that's in some ways in some ways, the Indologists were kind of pushing a kind of German idealist tradition in India, and it was working to, to quite an extent. And their own translations of some of the work brings through that element much more than any kind of empiricism. Empiricism doesn't come into India until very late, you know, with Buddhist and uh, some of the uh, Buddhist uh, uh, translations and so far. So, you know, this is a, a mood point of something like Hume hardly had any influence here. Voltaire had hardly influence. Why was it that a certain strand of you know, Neoplatonism, Neo-idolism is really the lens through which a lot of Indian philosophy was being written? Yeah. And, and so, you know, a caveat for Okay. Can I? Can I? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks. Um, no, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I agree. Uh, your, your understanding of uh, Radha Krishna and all those people. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, in idealist view of life, he was very much influenced by the kind of ideas that you were referring to. But if I contrast Radha Krishna's model with what I call Matilal model, right. okay. Then I think it's very uh, it's very uh, evident that you know uh, Radha Krishnan was not so eager to find out the kind of debates that were going on those days, uh, and then you know fit them 
in the traditional classical Indian philosophical system, and I mean, not as definitely as, not as vocal as Mathilal is. Maybe time has changed, so a lot of lot of things have you know uh, changed in in last 40, 50 years. Uh, uh, even see when uh, Mathilal's uh, you know um, inaugural professorial lecture in Oxford, the logical uh, illumination of mysticism. You know, he refers to two earlier spoiling professors. I think Zener was Zener and uh, and uh, Radhakrishnan, and he was trying to you know contrast his approach from these two earlier uh, earlier philosophers. But uh, yes, certainly. I mean, I, I mean, I agree with you to some extent. But still, I think there is a there is a there is a point where we can you know contrast these these two 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 models of comparative philosophy. If you if you want to talk about comparative philosophy at all in this sense, you know. Yes. yes. Hi, uh, this question is for Professor Uma Chattopadhyay. Yes. Um, I'm curious if there's something in, um, in Upamana and uh, theories of Sadrisha in uh, not just maybe uh, philosophy but also the Alankara tradition that we could bring to bear on some of these questions about comparative philosophy itself. Um, because it seems like one of the things that has been at issue here is um, in, in virtue of what are things similar, what are the relevant similarities. Uh, this has come up again as we've think, thought about uh, the Mimamsaka uh, rituals, right? W what is it that should be changed? What, it sh what it should, should not be changed? What is essential? And again, analogy comes up. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about how Upamana might be able to be used in a sort of a methodological sense to think about how to how to do philosophy. So we're not just looking at it, what Indian philosophy does, but take Indian philosophical um, traditions for thinking about philosophy itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I to give answers? Mm -hmm. Thank you. In this paper, I could not make all the concepts very clear <laughs> because. All the concepts, concept of upaman, concept of similarity, concept of shadrisho, and how the schools are accepting, these are actually uh, very, very important concepts and needs many lectures to make the points clear. So I've only tried to show that upaman is a source of knowledge in Indian tradition, uh, particularly by, admitted by the Nayo Bhaisheshikos, Nayo school, not, al not also by the Bhaisheshikos. Mimangsha school also admitted this uh, Upaman, but not for the same purpose. The Nayo school, that is the only school, those who admit Upaman as a source of knowledge, but the knowledge is a peculiar type of knowledge, knowledge by analogy, and that is Upaman. And where, where this Upaman, therefore, is uh, admitted as the Shokti Grahok, that means it makes the knowledge of relation between word and meaning. And this is the single, there are other sources to know the word meaning relationship. But this is a single source of knowledge, which is a source of knowledge at the same time it is, a, it is no, important for knowing the relation between word and the object. So, but the point is this, that these are discussed in Indian philosophical literature. And it appears to many, maybe to the Anglo-American philosophers or even to the other schools, that why they are so much interested with this concept. What is the philosophical significance? Significance is this, that we have a vast literature of philosophy of language. And in philosophy, both in Anglo-American philosophy, Western philosophy and here, the important question is, how we know the word meaning relationship? This is a basic, very basic question. And many, many philosophical opinions we find for that. So one opinion here is admitted as up the upaman, which is important. And the important, this is not only important that they both are admitted. The point is this, that from Gautam to Gangesh, this is, that is the 5th, uh, 6th century maybe, until the 12th century, the continuous philosophers are focusing on the very issue of Upman. Many of the commentators also discarded this. This is not so important. But again we find the commentators of Gangesh also is considering the source of knowledge. And this Knowledge by similarity, Upamana involves the similarity, which is another important notion, concept, which is used in science, philosophy, and also in our common sense behavior. 
and these are taken in the philosophical discourse that what is the status we have usages of similarity but what is the nature what is the status is it a metaphysical ex it has a metaphysical existence or not these are the philosophical questions the philosophy when considers the different concepts philosophically the concepts starts from our daily usages many many concepts are there and many many concepts are there in the sciences so how the philosophers are looking to the concept that is important and i have tried my best to show only within a very short span because it is a panel discussion and could not make the all the notions very clear i thought that things are known to the learned audience that what is upaman what is similarity what is universal and not even that similarity is by some philosophers they have tried to reduce similarity to this universal no need for similarity neither the nobunaya school they have done it gongesh has done this so this these are the in every point we find that there are different opinions of philosopher and so 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 we make the discussion and discourse and the things will be much more clear how to use the notions right so here i have presupposed some conceptions made some conceptions clear right but if i get much more time and if i can make the uh, article then i am to make all the concepts clear there professor shannal indrani shannal samne samne diye ja In fact I wanted to add something to Professor Billy Moria's question and in fact why there was more stress on idealism and was it german influence or not in fact what i find that philosophy is an integral part of culture and especially if we look to our indian background it was colonized india and people especially in that period who were doing philosophy they were very much influenced by the uh, what i say that dependent india and one of the ideas that played very important role is the idea of nationalism nation nationality and in that case it seems to me often that to integrate this political idea of nationalism they found would yield some fruitful result with a metaphysical or philosophical background and in that case idealism must have provided them some ground justification because idealism in a way in a way brings whole mass whole community irrespective of race language and religion closer it has the possibility of bringing it together so maybe that is also one of the reasons otherwise why of an i also start inquiring that why it has happened so why so many all the contemporary notable distinguished leaders they were very much influenced by this kind of idealistic thought i don't say that there were no exceptions definitely always there will be exceptions but when people flock together they found one very living justification for adhering to that kind of metaphysical position and with reference to uma i have also very important suggestion yes she has shown one very important way that how we can pursue this kind of multicultural or comparative philosophy that is very important but i would request her that instead of using examples of go and gabayo yes. you use examples of matter and jodo chaitanya and consciousness then it will be more evident that is for the paper but here i have not used <laughs> used any examples <laughs> professor yes. vaidya you want to respond i want to <coughs> okay. very very quickly no i don't think that it had to do necessarily with nationalism um one is that in the west at that time 
uh, the kind of philosophy that was done was not analytical philosophy. It was basically a kind of uh, idealistic, you know, a little bit of empiricism and so forth, and Hume skepticism. So those are the things that went to the colonies. It even went to Australia as well, and there was no need for nationalism there. What could have brought the country together in terms of nationalism is actually Marxism and so forth. But the Indologists made it very clear that Marxism did not come to India. You know, that, uh, uh, it did with the political thinkers, of course, later, you know, Emin Roy and people like that, and Bush, Bush, and Bush influenced Gandhi, influenced by socialism as well, which is what brought nationalism much more together. But idealism, I think, is not really what was at the backbone of generating any kind of nationalism. It was simply because of what was going on in the West. But sorry, um, and another <laughs> a simple analysis, Indranidhi, please, sorry. I want to make, because a big audience I'm finding, so one thing I am to make clear, I've given answer to Indranidhi, but yes, can, we can, I can change many uh, examples, but here in the paper I have not given any example. But there is also another important point to note in Indian tradition, and in every tradition, that two types of presentations, since presentations, one is the thematic presentation, where I'm doing the monon, the reasoning, etc., etc. Another is a stylistic presentation. For example, when one is doing this Rabindra Shongit or classical music, bhajan, the music, the song will be a bhajan, but it must have the style also for the bhajan. It should not be like the uh, this dhimjak, jigjak, jigjak bhajan. It's not will not be a bhajan. <laughs> that is the stylistic presentation. So in philosophical pre presentation also, when Indian philosophy, we generally use this gabaya, go, or ghata, pata, etc. So before that, or at the end point, I can write the sentence that I'm using these examples for the stylistic presentation. But that is not so much necessary for the thematic presentation, if I can make understanding to the others. So that is the st for the stylistic presentation, we use the standard example of the tradition. This, uh, this is important, not for my this, uh, learned scholars, but young students are also there, so for them. Thank you. It's the last observation from Professor Baitya. So um, I have a quick uh, comment to Professor Bhattacharya's paper about Buddhism, and the comment is uh, that uh, it, within the contemporary scientific investigation of memory, we are changing our views rapidly about what memory is. The idea of just talking about episodic memory or preservative memory with constructive memory and the fact of what is memory at a moment and whether it's being completely reconstructed out of certain other elements or whether it's being really preserved is something that we're learning a lot about in neuroscience. So I wonder if some of your query might be answered by looking at particularly what's going on there because some philosophers and neuroscientists who have investigated memory may think that the way in which memory actually works would feed into the question you were asking about how a Buddhist uh, would respond to this issue of memory. So that's a suggestion I think could help you. Now, pairing off that point, I wanted to ask Professor Chakrabarti, um, I know that you focused your conversation more on the notion of comparative philosophy, but I didn't know if any part of what your um, uh, uh, critical investigation was applied to the model that I presented. Because I presented a model that explicitly doesn't use the word comparison, but instead uses cross-cultural multidisciplinary, primarily because I associate myself with wanting to annex three things and not just two things. So I wonder, was there some component of what you said uh, as a criticism of comparative philosophy that applied to the model that I've advanced? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I, I, I really, you know, my, my comments are not specifically directed to kind of model that you were, uh, you know, engaged with, but my 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 uneasiness with the kind of Matilal model, so to say, uh, my my uneasiness with that model is that sometimes we, we you know we uh, are so eager to find out the specific problems that I am you know engaged in in the classical Indian scenario. Uh, to find out some kind of, you know, echo in contemporary, quote-unquote, analytic philosophy. And I would like to, you know, uh, remind myself also, analytic philosophy is, the no, is not the whole of Western philosophy. And there are, you know, there are many, many uh, uh, important uh, philosophical traditions uh, apart from the Oxford style of analytic philosophy. Okay, so, yes, please. Just, so then maybe it might be useful for me to distinguish the model I'm advancing versus the ones that you're talking right, about. Right, right. The, the purpose of the model I'm advancing is to speak to the public and to speak to the fact that in very countries, there's a decline
decline in interest in philosophy. And I feel that the only way to really engage that is to adopt the model that I'm pursuing. It's not about particularly, I don't understand even what this idea of like, uh, there's only certain problems I want to pay attention to. I, I don't even understand that because my cross-cultural model isn't East or West. I work in a department with African American philosophers and Latin American philosophers, so it's East, West, North, and South. Wanting to create conversations between Aztec philosophy and Advaita Vedanta through neuroscience is something that I'm interested in doing. I think the only way to speak to the kind of population that I see is to use these three things. So if there's a particular critique that you're interested in making that applies to my model, I'd be very interested in hearing it. But from what you said, it seemed like you were talking to an older sort of generational development of a model that's come out of India and England. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I mean, but precisely when, I, when I'm talking about comparative philosophy, I'm, I'm talking about comparative philosophy as it is understood or practiced in the Indian academic uh, philosophical scenario. But these are the problems that we face, these are the questions that we have to, you know, somehow find answers to. Yeah. And last question from there. Uh, okay. Okay, I have one thing to add. Now, socialistic outpoint is not necessarily connected with Marxist outpoint, viewpoint, and in fact, Socialism, that can be also spiritual socialism. Yes. And in right. fact, the modern period, it is characterized by three ideas. Though these ideas, we say that we got it from the French Revolution of liberty, equality, and fraternity. But in the Indian model, in fact, Vivekananda himself has shown that fraternity is more important in our case. Mm -hmm. And what I feel that if we put emphasis on fraternity and if we look for any metaphysics, in that case, idealism suits our goal very well. And maybe, I, I'm just guessing, maybe that was one of the reasons that had given rise to so much idealistic tendencies in the country. Last of the questions. I last Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I had a question for Kuntaladi. Uh, uh, so I was actually, I thought the argument that you were raising was interesting and there was something to it. Uh, but I was wondering whether it really sinks the Buddhist, what the Buddhist really wants to do. Uh, so the thought is that suppose there are certain causal connections between the different time slices of a person um, which are right and which are actually what makes the person sort of persist over time, even though there might not be any self associated with the person, which like in the sense of the Nyaya, the Vaisheshika view. But I was thinking whether, like suppose we agree that there are these right causal connections, but does that already commit the Buddhist to a persisting self in the sense of like the self having a strict, a bunch of strict identity conditions? So you might think that there are causal, co there is causal continuity of some sort, but that continuity does not amount to strict identity conditions. And as long as there is that gap between continuity and identity conditions, you can still have a view where there is no self, persisting self with strict identity conditions. So my impression is that the Buddhists are happy to say that, like you can interpret the discourse about self as persisting, however you want, as long as there is no thing which has strict identity conditions. So the thought is that even though there might be right ca causal links, that need not commit you to something with strict identity conditions. Uh, actually, what I was trying to um, say is that um, the construction of persons out of totally impersonal uh, psychophysical elements, that doesn't hold true. That's what I was thinking about. And about your personal identity, uh, I'll just think over it, yes. But I think so. Uh, if there are no impersonal, if these impersonal causal elements cannot uh, prove uh, the, I mean, they are not sufficient to explain a person's uh, memory, 
then is it not that uh, identity is also not proved? Uh, it's a, it's a rather a matter of soteriological importance that I am not believing in a person, but whether it can be proved um, by this method of deconstruction and that that was my question. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of now course. I thank all the uh, speakers for their excellent presentations and the audience for their uh, active participation, which has made this session very lively. Thank you. Somebody was saying in the previous session, in one of the previous sessions, that in philosophy there is no ending. Uh, that's why we are behind the schedule by 15 minutes. So uh, we now have a valedictory session before we break for tea. May we please request you to kindly stay seated until the vote of thanks is over. So we'll then have the tea break after that. Uh, we thank all the panel members here who have so uh, wonderfully said what they wish to say. May we now request the other speakers to kindly come up to the dais and panel members, if you could kindly come uh, and sit in the auditorium so that we can start uh, right away. We have an interactive session for about one hour and 15 minutes and then a few concluding remarks by Professor Jayashankar Lal Shah. The interactive session will be coordinated by Professor Shah. So may we now request the other speakers to kindly come up on the dais.